Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. Last of a series, eight messages dealing with the love of God. And today I'm speaking on the subject, the love of God brings confidence of right living. Confidence of right living. Chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And now, little children, abide in him. When he appears, we may have confidence, not be ashamed. Can I pose a question? Jesus, we're coming this afternoon. You had no time to get ready. Would you welcome him and run to him as a father would run, who is a son? Or would you do what Adam and Eve did in the garden? Would you hide yourself? The word ashamed really means to shrink back. Would you shrink back or would you welcome him? Can you say with John the Apostle in the book of the Apocalypse, the Revelation, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So he tells us if we abide in him, well, when he appears, we may have confidence, not be ashamed before him at his coming. Verse 29. <clears throat> If you know that he is righteous, that is, do you believe that God is righteous? Uh, in, survey was taken recently and it was asked, do you believe Jesus sinned? And a large number of the American populace said they believe Jesus sinned. I want to tell you this. If he did, there's no chance that anyone will ever be able to deal with your sin. You better thank God he's the sinless son of God so he can reach down and deal with our sins. The Bible says... He is righteous. We looked at it last week. We have an advocate in the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Thank God he is righteous. And the Bible says you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Speak, Lord Jesus, for Christ's sake, amen. You may be seated. I want you to listen carefully. To I, I sort of tried to choose my words well to kind of introduce this thought. And I want you to listen to it. The believer reveals his estimate. That is the worth and the glory of Jesus Christ. Someone says, someone says, I want to give glory to Jesus. It means the English word would be speak of my estimate of him, bear witness to his worth, his weight compared to to everything else in my life he's heavy so the believer reveals his estimate his worth his glory of Jesus Christ by the degree to which he submits or surrenders to Christ being his life and re reproducing his life in him and so when one sees the submission of the Lord Jesus to his father's will and then rebel rebels he reveals that he does not think highly of Christ as he ought the way, the way I live as a believer speaks louder than words as to my estimate and my worth and the way I cherish the glory of King Jesus. So our commitment to the revealed love of God reveals righteousness in living that produces confidence in Christ that we serve even in light of his coming again. So I just wrote three statements. W want to walk through them, want to serve and ser share the Lord's Supper with you. Number one, listen to this. The love of God produces great incentive for godly living. Uh, when I was in unlovable, nothing in me, commending myself to God, God unconditionally, undeservingly loved me. That serves and produces within me once I came to know the love of God. How did I know to come to know the love of God? Through the cross, through repentance of my sins, surrender to Jesus. And when I came to know that love because he first loved me and now I love him, I believe the Bible says this produces a great incentive for godly living. Why would you live the Christian life? Because God loved me. God loves me un conditionally so the day of Christ's return is coming and the Apostle John sees it as an awesome hope for the future and a powerful motivation 
for the present. And so this fact, John is saying, 93 years old. He's known him for maybe 60 years. He's living longer than any apostle. And he says, I'm telling you this fact that he's coming back. And by the way, he would have been there when he left. And he's been waiting, believing, expectant, still expectant that he's coming and has built hope in his heart and a motivation to live right in the present. Now, to abide in him, I, I want to abide in him, means to remain in fellowship. You, you ever broken fellowship with Jesus? I have. And there's nothing like getting back in fellowship with him. Some of you are struggling right now. You say, I can't understand that. Are you married? You ever been out of fellowship with your spouse? If not, I don't want y'all as friends. You'll mess my wife's mind up. And then you, you make up. You, you ask forgiveness and you enter back in. It, it, it means to abide in Jesus. It means to settle down. It means to dwell in a place where you feel at home. It means to have access to the whole place. For, for me to abide in Jesus, there can be no closed closets. I can't have anything in my phone or anything in my internet that he's not welcome to. And so I want to abide in, in him. I, I just wrote this down, maybe to help you. I thought three areas that I've covered over the last seven weeks. I want to abide in him in the area of obedience. How do you do that? You obey his truth. Now, I want to make a statement. I taught this to my discipleship group. There's a difference in believing a truth and obeying a truth. Now, people are quick to affirm a truth. This is true. I doubt that if you're a believer this morning, if I were able to say to you, ask you, how many of you believe that God can take care of every need you'll ever have? How many of you believe that God concerns himself with your needs and that God has taken care of you so far in your life. I believe everyone would say, I believe that. And then, and I'm not trying to be ugly, I'm just trying to make a point. How many of you are faithfully committed to submitting your income at his pleasure to use for the furtherance of his kingdom to the glory of God? And someone might quick be able to say, I can't afford it. Let me tell you, if you're not careful, you are constantly affirming truth therefore you say you believe but your belief really comes to become rubbered it hits the road when you obey the truth you claim you believe and by the way it's not the truth I believe that's ever made a difference in somebody's life it's the truth that I've obeyed and so in areas of obedience I want to abide and obey the truth and I don't always but I want to and then in areas of love love other Christians and love the lost Someone wrote me this week from Canada. They watch us every week. He's watching me now, I'll assure you. He even goes downtown into a major city and throws my sermon up on a big screen. Do you believe that? And, and so for people to watch it. And, and he wrote me and he said, the greatest struggle in my life is that those who claim to know the Lord and don't live it and are even twisting the scriptures, he says, it's hard to love them. <laughs> Uh, Jesus never said it'd be hard to love them, but, and by the way, let me just make a clear statement. It might be hard for you to love them, but God never really called you to love them. He called you to love him, and when you love him rightly, he does the loving through you as you abide in him. And I just need to tell you, he's not having trouble loving anybody, and the way I know that is he redeemed you. And me. Balance it out. Number three, in the area of truth. In other words, believe the truth and act upon it. In our scripture memory this week, we've been memorizing a lot of verses over in the book of Hebrews. And it'll say, and Abraham obeyed God and went out. So he could have said he believed God and he's struggling with what he should do with it. But know when you obey, you move upon that which you believe. So there's three things that will get you out of fellowship with the Father. Number one, if you disobey the word. God gives you clear directive and you go against his word. A lack of love for a brother will get you out of fellowship with the Lord. You'll find yourself unforgiving. And the Bible teaches in Mark chapter 11 and verse 25 and 26 that when you stand praying, if you don't forgive your brother of his trespass, neither will the Father forgive you of your trespass. So a lack of love for the brother. And then another thing that will get you out of fellowship with the Lord is you begin to believe a lie. So because I'm going to be like him in the future and for all eternity... 
Such a promise has a wonderful transforming effect in the present. My future impacts my life today. My future impacts my life today. I think about eternity kind of regularly. And the older I get, I think about it more. And the songs we were singing today, whether he comes back for me in death or his return. So he refers to him as a spiritual father. We keep seeing that over and over again in the text. He says in little children, John's given several words of challenge and encouragement up to this point of writing. So let me just do a review. We've been eight weeks. Today's the last message. Listen to what we've kind of covered. Number one, God has encouraged them to find full joy in fellowship with himself and with his son. You want to know fellowship? Find that fellowship with God the Father and with His Son, the Lord Jesus. Number two, He has called them to walk in the light of God and to stay close to Christ. That's what chapter 1, verse 2, verse 5, and through chapter 2 and verse 2 is all about. So how do you do that? By obeying the Lord's commands and by loving others. Number three, know your spiritual status and not be seduced by the world. Uh, number four, beware of the enemies of faith who deny Jesus as Messiah. Now, the exhortation to abide in Christ and pursue a righteous life as they live in hope of His coming is what we're looking at today. By the way, in light of the Lord's Supper, in the context of the Lord's Supper, He tells us to examine ourselves. He says, if you judge yourself, you'll not be judged of God. What does that mean? Don't, don't just act like there's no sin in your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal anything in your life that is not in the life of Jesus and then confess it to him judge your own sin and you judge it by bringing it to the judge and pleading the mercy through his son and so in other words what we're going to be then will transform the way we live today he says it's not yet been known all the mysteries but we already are called the children of God Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now we're the children of God, and it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that what we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. So abide, again, remain. It's a command. It calls for consistent action. Uh, there's no time for me to slack up. Paige Patterson used to say to me when I was a, a student, he would say, Johnny, you can't coast one day. And I found that to be true. Chapter 2, verse 24 says it best. Listen to this. Let, therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. In other words, here's what he's saying. Soak in the Savior... And the gospel message that you heard at the start of your journey. So really, even what I started with remains in my life. So let me go a step further. Number two, the love of God pictures a glorious inspiration. It's a claim here in the text. The Bible says that when he appears, in other words, Christ is coming again. When, when is he coming? I don't know. I know this. <laughs> it's a day sooner than it was yesterday. And he is coming again i want to live my life in light of his return would you want this in your life if you knew he was coming today so i want to live in light of his imminent return that's inspiring and imminent so christ will appear on this earth again officially in full public display as king of kings and lord of lords first john 3 2 puts it this way we know that when he is revealed that's the unveiling the revelation the apocalypse, when he will come. It's a claim. But then it, it brings confidence to not only believe this, but this future hope inspire your present living. Why do you live the way you live? I live, first of all, because God loves me and I'm overwhelmed and inspired by the love of God that when there's nothing in me to commend me to God, God would love me. And then even in light of the fact, not only does he love me, he's coming again for me. I'm going to spend eternity forever with him. And this inspires me. It really gives me a confidence. The Bible puts it this way in verse 28. We may have confidence. It means you have boldness. Abiding brings with it a wonderful companion, assurance. Any, anytime you're really faithful, isn't it wonderful to live? Think of this. Isn't it wonderful to live not fearing what may be disclosed about you? 
It gives a confidence, doesn't it? Now, 1 John 4, 17. Now listen to this because it's going to finish beautifully. Love has been perfect, perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now hold on. It's one thing to have boldness because he's coming. It's another thing to have boldness because our hearts have not condemned us. But it's another thing to have boldness in the day of judgment. What judgment? It is appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. Pastor, do you think you will stand in judgment? Yeah, I will appear, the Bible teaches in 1 John chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 and following. I will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. A little Greek word, bema, B-E-M-A. And it's a reviewing. And I believe there my sin has been judged in his son because I repented and received his forgiveness. But I will give an account of what I did with what Jesus entrusted to me. All right? So that's why I want to surrender and let God use me. How about for a person that's never been saved? Will they be at the judgment seat of Christ? No, Revelations chapter 20 and verse 10. They will be at the great white throne judgment. Everyone there, I didn't write the book, everyone there will be sentenced to the lake of fire. Uh, they will be judged according to their works because they feel that what they've done will get them to heaven, and the Bible makes it clear that can't happen. But they will be judged according to their works. At the Bema, we will be judged according to his works, what he did at the cross. And so the Bible teaches that we can have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world as he is and he is god and he's the one so when the bible speaks about having boldness listen to this language it's speaking of liberty liberty in speaking it means unreservedness in speech it speaks of cheerful courage it speaks of boldness now let, let me give a verse that really speaks I, I read the proverbs every day so i like every now and then to get even greater clarity on the proverbs listen to this proverbs chapter 28 and verse 1 the wicked flee when no one pursues why are they running why is somebody running when nobody's chasing them but the righteous are bold as a lion bold as a lion why is the lion so bold and why is the wicked fleeing? Here's a great translation. A guilty conscience imagines accusers everywhere. It's been said that when there's sin in your life and you think that it may have leaked out, everybody you see, you wonder, do they know? Does he know? In other words, everything, your, your conscience is accusing you. And you feel everybody else knows what they know, when in truth, nobody else knows. But when you have a clear conscience, you're bold to face everyone and the word bold there really speaks more in the context of liberty it's a liberty that God gives you and so here's a question when he returns will you run toward him as a child runs to a loving father or will you draw back and attempt to hide at his glorious coming remember when Adam and Eve were in fellowship with God what did the Bible said they did every day they said they walked with the Lord in the cool of the day right but then God said don't partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil for the day you do you will die did they die absolutely somebody says they were still alive they died spiritually so what happened instead of looking forward to walking in fellowship with God that day when God came in the garden what question did he ask where are you and by the way let me ask you a question how many of you believe he knew where they were <laughs> he gave them a chance to come clean and they said we're over here hiding and they said, why are you hiding? And they said, we're naked. And he knew immediately, he said, you've eaten of the tree. See, isn't it amazing? He didn't go in there and say, now when you're naked, you better hide from me. They're, listen to me, listen to me. Their hearts condemn them. Ladies and gentlemen, God's placed a heart, a conscience. Now, don't let your conscience be your guide. Let your conscience be guided by the Word of God. But your conscience is like the alarm system at my house. When my alarm's on, you open my door, and it goes beep, 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 and it starts getting louder and louder, and if you forget the code or Janet, change the code. <laughs> and then that joker goes off. Whoa, whoa! I mean, you can hear it across the street in a moment. The sheriff's there and the police are there. 
The Bible says in Mark 8, 38, Jesus speaking, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and his holy angels. What he's saying is, you live right now. You're not a believer. Matter of fact, the things of Christ could even uh, cause you to have shame, to even be affiliated with it. And the Bible says when Christ comes, it'll turn, he'll turn his face away from you. Is what it translates. He turns his face away from you. Here's another way to say it. Revelation 6, 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's someone that's ashamed of his coming. So in the Lord's Supper, we're to reflect on his coming. He's coming. The Bible says that when you come together, think of this until I come. Now, let me give you a, a third word. Listen to this word. I called somebody this week and said, what's the song you used to sing? And I was going to put the words in here, but I didn't. But it's, it's a continuance. Now, I want to make a statement and give you the text. The Bible teaches as we abide in Christ. We ought to live in such a way. Here's the language of the Bible. Now, stay with me. We ought to live in such a way that when Jesus comes or we go to be with him, there's very little change. <laughs> See, somebody tries to make heaven boring, like, I don't know why y'all want to talk about heaven. All you're going to do is sit on a cloud with wings and play a harp. Number one, I know nothing of playing a harp in heaven. Number two, you're not going to have wings because the angels will look in and glory at what God did for us and saved us. And so we're not going to be angels. We're, we're saints that have been, have been redeemed and have come out because we've been washed white in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I don't know anything about setting on clouds. I just know this, that the clouds are his footprints, the Word of God says. And so I don't know about all that. What I'm going to do, the Bible says we're going to worship him. We're going to worship the Lamb. Uh, we're going to sing to him, and I've always kind of liked to sing but I'm going to really show out up there. So, uh, so, so if we abide, listen to this. Here's how I wrote it. If we abide, his return is only a continuation of the former. And I just want, to, I want you to know this. I, you know this story. I was 20 when I came to know him. I've been living for him 43 years. If I had 10,000 lives, I'll say along with Wesley and all the others, I'd want to live every one of them for him. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? I'd want to give every one of them. If I had 10,000 lives, I'd want to give every one of them to him. Well, I don't have 10,000 lives to give him, but I've got one for every eternity, and I'm glad I'm able to give it to him, to live for him and serve him. And that's what that text means. So in light of the Lord's Supper, it's not only that he's coming, but when he comes, it ought to be a continuation. I'm abiding in him. Now I will be with him. So John is saying we should live so close in fellowship that his coming will only be a continuation of the same fellowship that was begun here. Now here's a great truth. No matter in which direction a Christian looks, he finds reasons to openly obey God. If he looks back, he sees Calvary, where Christ died for his sins. If he looks within, he sees the Holy Spirit who lives within him and teaches and guides him and directs him and enables him. If he looks around, he sees his Christian brethren whom he loves. And he also sees a world lost in sin, desperately needing his godly witness. And if he looks ahead, he sees the return of Christ. Let me give you a third statement, and I need to quit. Time's up. The love of God precedes godly living. Everyone who does what is right has been born of God. So I've been born of God, so now I am being a child of God. And then I really desire to, in my doing, to live righteously. And it's not my righteousness. Remember, it's imparted righteousness as deaf to self, uh, render myself and reckon myself dead to sin, crucified with Christ. But nevertheless, I live. So Christ is living in me. I live through the faithfulness of the Son of God. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let nobody deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. And practice means habitual. It becomes a, a habit. It doesn't mean that you never do wrong. It means that the, the, the typical rhythm of your life is that of living as a child of God. It's what we call the, the root fruit argument. The new birth precedes the new behavior. 
Being born again has a definite and an abiding result. Our practice is proof of our parentage. God is my Father. Our practice is proof of our parentage. So this righteous Savior, Jesus Christ, produces righteous saints through His righteousness. And so 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you, so you may not sin. But if anyone sins, it's an act of sin you commit. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So the grounds... For living right is Jesus Christ. Our practice of right living gives evidence that we have truly been born again into the family of God. It's not our prayers. It's not our baptism. It's not church membership. All these three are important. But our change of life to following and practicing righteousness, Jesus Christ is the key. And and here's what he says, and I, I close with this statement. If you know that he is righteous, two things. That word reminds us us. Number one is emphasizing the absolute and intuitive knowledge. I have come to know this. I know it intuitively, and I know it even in practice. And it speaks of learned by experience. I've learned who God is through my experiential relationship with him over 43 years, through the truth of his word, through the presence and person of his Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, Speak deeply into our hearts. Thank you for the incentives for holy living that you have given us. Thank you that you are our advocate. Thank you that we can abide in you now, wait for your appearing, and then long and look forward to spending forever and forever and forever. And though I don't have a lot of lives to give you, I can give you the one that you've given me, and then that life will continue without end. Thank you for that. 